Welcome to New Hope Presbyterian Church. We've come together today to worship our Lord and our Savior and to hear the preaching of the Word. And we have today with us Pastor Tom Church who will bring us the message. So at this time I'd like to ask you to rise as I give the call to worship. And today uh, we're I'm going to be reading from Psalm 100, verses 3 and 4. I hear now the word of God. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we seek to worship you today and to lift up praises to you. Uh, you know our hearts, you know they're troubled with this time, with the pandemic. We pray, Lord, that you would encourage us by the reading and the hearing of the word and the gathering together of the saints. And we pray this worship time now will be a blessing to you. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Our first hymn will be uh, number 457, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Now we'll go again to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we're reminded by the, the hymn that we just sung, we sang, and we think of how rebellious we were towards you before you called us to yourself. We did not understand your glory and your might and your love for us, your long suffering. We just thought of ourselves. But you called us to hear your word and then to understand that you are our God. You are our Father, our Redeemer, our Light. Our one purpose is to glorify you and to love you always. And yet you know in our hearts we fall short, but we run back to you and we ask forgiveness and we see your glory and your love for us. We pray, Lord, that you would awaken our hearts, and those around us, those hearing this, that they might hear the word of God. And if they know the Lord, that they might be encouraged and strengthened through this difficult time in our nation. Lord, we pray for our local, state, and federal officials that have been placed over us. Uh, give us patience as we wait through these things. And give them ears that they might hear you, that their hearts might be changed if they know not you. That they might know your glory. Oh, how you love us. Even though we fail. And you always hear us when we pray. And Lord, we think of this time of year that our church gathers together uh, to give a thank offering for the missions here and throughout the world under the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We pray, Lord, that these monies, along with our regular tithes and offerings this morning, would be a glory to you, would be used throughout the world to present the gospel, to call the lost. Lord, we just pray that our work, our tithes, our thoughts, and our time of worship would be glorifying to you and you would encourage us through this tough time. For we know you do not slumber nor do you sleep. You are always there. And now, Lord, we pray for the rest of this morning. We pray for Pastor Tom Church as he brings us your word. Uh, guard his steps and help him to bring us your word that we might hear, be changed, and be encouraged. We ask this now. And we say all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you. We have some of the most beautiful fall weather that um, you know, I've had for a long time. You know, so I hope you have a chance to get out and enjoy it. Um, it's one of those safe things you can do. <laughs> well, our, um, <clears throat> this is um, actually the uh, first Sunday in Advent. Does it feel like that? Christmas coming? <laughs> After the um, happy parents learn that they're expecting and the um, announcement has been made, um, and the gender reveal has occurred, all these things that now happen. But one of the first questions that people ask, of course, is what should we name him? What will be her name? And, and that can uh, precipitate a, a great deal of debate. There are books and long lists that are dedicated to helping name your children. And names are important. Um, the, um, a name might signify a description of the child or the parent's aspirations of the child. Um, um, I was mentioning earlier that um, I, in a former congregation there was a family that named their son Rex. 
you know, king. <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. My, my first son was named Ezra, from the Azar helper. My second son, Ephraim, which means uh, twice blessed. And so we tried to, um, to follow along in that way, but, um, but it's no small matter. There's sometimes um, family expectations, sometimes there's traditions, and even pressure to brought to bear to name the child after some notorious um, relative or ancestor. So no small matter naming a child. But uh, do you know that <clears throat> there once were some parents who had no difficulty whatsoever in naming their child because he'd already been named for them by God himself. God, in the Matthew the book of the Gospel of Matthew, sends an angel and he appears to Joseph in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son and you are to call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Now that was not by any means an arbitrary choice, that name. It was significantly the name of a very famous ancestor of Jesus, whom we know as Joshua. Joshua was chosen by Moses as his successor uh, to lead the children of Israel <clears throat> into um, uh, the land of Canaan the promised land. Moses uh, then prophetically changed that young man's name. His given name was, uh, was Hoshea, which in Hebrew means uh, he saves, but uh, Moses changed that to Jehoshua, or as we say it, Joshua, which means Je uh, Jehovah saves, to remind us that it's not man who saves, uh, but God. And in the language of the New Testament, in Greek, the name Joshua comes to us as Jesus. But by looking at one particular incident from the life of this man Joshua, back in the Old Testament, we actually get a great deal of insight um, as to uh, this one who would follow him, really the one for whom Joshua was named, uh, the Lord Jesus, the living God whose birth we're preparing to celebrate as we begin this first week of Advent. So with all that said, if you'll turn in your Bibles to the uh, book of Joshua and the second chapter, we'll read that chapter I'll read and you can follow along. Um, Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible following Deuteronomy. And uh, we'll look in chapter 2 and read that chapter. The word of the Lord. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid out in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know 
that the Lord has given you the land and the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you, uh, uh, when you uh, came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our lives for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord has given us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, where the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go on your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Uh, behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all their father's household. Then <clears throat> if anyone goes out of doors of your house, the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to our oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. She sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all the way, along the way, and found nothing. <clears throat> then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they all told and they told them all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the inhabitants into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So in this text we see Joshua revealed to us as both judge and savior. First we see him as judge, as an instrument of judgment upon the Canaanite city of Jericho. Um, when the modern Bible reader, however, reads this book of Joshua, he's often faced with uh, a problem. And the problem is that the entire book of Joshua is dedicated largely to the purpose of describing the Israelites' total destruction, the harem warfare uh, that they unleashed on the Canaanite culture, on the cities and on the people. Uh, they invade the entire land and take it as their inheritance and that by the specific command of God Almighty, a sort of scorched earth Warfare that um, to our modern ears um, appears harsh and unjust. But it's not. 
in fact, it was a matter of justice. And our God is nothing if not a God of justice. Uh, let me try to explain that. If you turn back to the book of, of Genesis, uh, we're reminded that God made a covenant with his people Israel, even before they existed as his people, uh, before uh, they had uh, formally brought them to people together as his people. Uh, and he made it through their ancestor, uh, Abraham. He promised Abraham, then who was living uh, as a foreigner in Canaan, in fact, that God was going to make a great nation out of him and that he would be given the entire land of Canaan for his own, but not right away. In Genesis 15, 16, we read, in the fourth generation, your descendants, this is the word of God speaking to Abraham, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. And then he tells Abraham the reason for the delay uh, why four generations? Because the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached its full measure. Uh, speaking later to the Israelites through Moses about how they were to drive the Canaanites out of the land, God says, Deuteronomy 9, after the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourselves, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is an account of the wickedness of these nations that God is going to drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the late Francis Schaeffer describes this principle of delayed judgment uh, using a familiar biblical image of the cup of, of God's wrath which you read frequently through scripture, old and new, about the cup of wrath being slowly filled by the wickedness of men. Uh, I think of this in a visual way, he writes. I imagine myself holding a cup which has water dripping into it. The water does not come quickly, but I keep holding the cup. And gradually the water rises, and at a certain point, it flows over the brim. This is the principle of the judgment of God. Man's revolt against God is there. And, and God waits in long suffering till every possibility of man's turning back is exhausted. But when <clears throat> the iniquity is full, when the cup overflows, God's judgment comes. We see this principle illustrated for us in a number of places throughout the history of the world and throughout scripture. Um, at the flood, for example, we read that, quote, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of his thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And so God brought this great flood to destroy the people. And when did that happen? It happened of the iniquity was full and overflowing. We see it again in the case of the two wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, places that had become so utterly wicked and depraved, filled with such pride and violence and meanness and sexual perversity that there were not even to be able to be found 10 righteous people in the entire city, not even 10 who loved the Lord. And so uh, finally the cup was full and um, earthly judgment came. So when we come to our text here in, Genesis, or in Joshua 2, where the Lord God sends the Israelites into the land of Canaan to drive them off, uh, we see this yet again. The sin of the Amorites now, however, had reached its full measure. The point of judgment of which God had spoken to Abraham had come. The cup was full. And together with the testimony of the biblical record, archeological evidence gives proof of this. Uh, digs in modern Palestine have apparently uncovered um, uh, evidence, much evidence of, of Canaanite life and worship that was not only um, idolatrous, but also um, 
filled with um, rebellion against God and also intertwined with gross sexual immorality, statuary, pictures uncovered at that time were vulgar and perverse and pornographic. And, and the violence and injustice of that culture, uh, the Canaanite culture, had apparently also become overwhelming. And God had had enough. And the time for judgment had come. And Joshua and the armies of Israel served then as a human agent or the means by which uh, God brought that judgment upon the land of Canaan to uh, eradicate <clears throat> the wicked influence of both the inhabitants and the culture, their cities being burned to the ground and turned to rubble, as we see in the case of Jericho, in which, uh, which we should look at today and see as a foreshadowing, a warning, if you will, of eternal judgment to come. In Paul's letter to the Romans, um, God speaks um, of a white horse coming. He speaks of the end of the age being marked uh, by the fullness of the Gentiles which must come in. Now, when we read that expression, the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, we usually take it to refer to the full number of God's elect of the nations being saved uh, before Christ will return. But it, could it not also refer uh, to the fullness of the wickedness of the Gentiles also being fulfilled? When Jesus was asked when he would return, he replied that uh, it would be at the time that, which would look similar to the days of Noah and the days of, of Sodom. When it's like those days, then I will return. A look at Genesis 17. And brothers and sisters, uh, may I gently suggest uh, and ask, what does it look like today in this land and many lands throughout the world? Doesn't it look like the days of Sodom and Noah and Canaan, uh, a day ripe for judgment? Now, it's a historical fact that people of every age, Christians of every age have often remarked upon their time and uh, named it as a time and culture fit for judgment. Um, should we not give a thought to that ourselves and wonder if our own nation is not at least flirting with that same terrible point at which a merciful but holy God will be no longer able to, to delay where his forbearance and patience will have reached an end. Someone has said, if God spares the United States any longer, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But certainly, um, we, have an that, uh, we live in a nation which murders unborn children by the millions and flaunts its sexual perversity in the highest places of government. And, and then, like the prostitute of, of Proverbs 30, wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Well, but listen, because this may surprise you, who will be the judge? Who uh, will be the Joshua of this age? <clears throat> Hear these words from the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation of Christ. Um, I'm actually preaching through this in, uh, at Faith at Pull Tavern in the evenings. Haven't come to this point, but um, we will. I'm in uh, Revelation chapter 19 from verse 11 where we read that then uh, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like uh, a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And likewise, in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, we read that in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, for he has set a day to judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, who is this appointed man who was raised from the dead who will judge the world? Who is the rider of the white horse? Well, it's none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, and we have his words recorded in scripture, <clears throat> when the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite name for himself, comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a Shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Joshua the conquering commander of the Old Testament who came to bring holy war of judgment is a type, is a shadow of Joshua, uh, the Jesus to come. And when he does come, for very many, he will come like Joshua came to Canaan um, as an agent of judgment and damnation. And I don't presume to, presume to know when that will be, but certainly it it wouldn't be unfair to any man if he came yesterday. And, and this is a terrible subject, and, and it's not particularly something I prefer to even speak much of. But I, I do feel the text demands to be applied in this manner. Uh, we must recognize that the warrior Joshua points us unfailingly to Jesus, who is the judge of all men. That is one of his prophetic and kingly functions. But fortunately, we can move on and see the brighter side to this coin, which is also given us in this text, for we cannot fail to notice that Joshua appears to us not only as judge, but also as savior. Uh, for you see in the text that um, not all are judged, and, and not all refuse the grace of God. And that's set before us in this text with, in the figure of this woman, Rahab, and her family who are spared. Um, but what we are given to see here pretty quickly is uh, that this woman, Rahab, is not represented to us uh, as a particularly upright or deserving woman. Uh, in fact, uh, she's clearly described to us as a harlot here in Joshua 2 and elsewhere she's called a Rahab the prostitute. Uh, she was probably an innkeeper, an innkeeper perhaps with a reputation for the immoral manner in which she entertained some of her guests. And her establishment was a sort of, the sort of low class dive where people didn't ask too many questions when you came in for a meal in a room. Just the sort of shadowy place for the two spies sent by Joshua to scope out the city and find the weak places in its defenses, a place where perhaps they wouldn't attract too much attention to themselves. But as it turns out, they were identified and men come to Rahab's door to find them. Bring out the men who have come to you and entered your house. And Rahab then lies to the soldiers and hides the spies, later helping them to escape. Um, but the most amazing thing and the, uh, is the remarkable conversation that is recorded here between Rahab and the spies. Now remember, Rahab is a Canaanite woman. That's all she's ever known. She's grown up in a Canaanite city, immersed in Canaanite culture and idolatry and and, uh, and yet here in our text, by the amazing grace of God, she pushes all of that aside. And here in verses 8 to 11, she steps forward and makes this incredible confession of faith. 
I know, she tells the spies, that the Lord, and she uses the tetragrammaton, the, the, the Yahweh, the covenant name of God. She says, I know Yahweh has given you this land. Where did she learn to use that name? Where did she learn this? Uh, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and the earth beneath. And she presents this as a statement of fact, as a statement of faith. That was her conclusion. That was her conviction. That was this woman's tremendous sweeping confession of the true and living God. How could she have done that? How could she understand that? How could this simple woman confess the true and living God? For that was her saving confession of faith. And we know that's true because a thousand years later, her name is listed in the New Testament book of Hebrews as one of the great women of faith. One of the wonderful things in scripture is when you, um, you find the Old Testament uh, uh, explained by the New, isn't it? And here's one of these cases because we, this woman turns up, Rahab turns up in the book of Hebrews as one of the great women of faith. And what does that show us? If not uh, the sovereign mercy and loving grace of Almighty God, um, uh, who takes this woman, this harlot, and a Canaanite, and a condemned woman, and reaches down and breaks into her life and gives her a saving faith in the true and living God, touches her heart, opens her eyes to see and recognize the truth, even when it comes to her from the hand of the deadly enemies of her people. And, and God brings then deserved judgment on the Canaanite city of, Joshua, of Jericho through Joshua, but to this woman Rahab, uh, Joshua brings deliverance. Before escaping through her window, the spies say to Rahab, this oath that you've made to, uh, to swear will not be binding on us. She had made them swear that, she would, that uh, they would spare her and her family if she was silent about uh, their, their errand. And uh, she, she says, uh, this, uh, and they say to her, this oath that you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and unless you have brought your father and mother and brothers and all your family into the house. That's verses 17 and 18. Now what is this scarlet cord? Well, it's another shadow. It is a type of the blood of Christ. The, uh, the, the, the blood red scarlet cord in the window is like the blood of the Passover lamb over the doors uh, of the Israelites in Egypt. Remember, as the death angel, the angel of judgment, passed over those homes, uh, even the Israelite homes who deserve judgment as much as the Egyptians, well, as they passed those homes covered with the blood of the lamb in Egypt, uh, those homes, those inhabitants were spared. So in the same way, the soldiers of Joshua who destroyed the city of Jericho and all its inhabitants passed by and spared the house of Rahab when they saw the blood red scarlet cord hanging in the window. To Jericho, Joshua uh, was an instrument of judgment but to Rahab, he was an instrument of grace by which she was saved. For what are these blood red symbols but pictures and shadows and reminders of the merciful heart of God who in the fullness of time would send his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our savior, to shed his blood on the cross to pay for the sin of his people. It was only because of the blood of Christ sacrificed in Salvary, at Calvary that Noah was spared and Lot was spared and, and the Israelites were spared judgment at the Passover in Egypt. And the same blood of Christ saved also Rahab from the deserved judgment at the hands of Joshua. It was not her goodness that saved her. She was not a good person. And, and it was the remarkable faith, though, that she acknowledged God. It was all a matter of grace. God himself gave her spiritual eyes to see and a mouth to make a good confession. 
How can this be? How could she have been saved only by a savior, the Joshua of the New Testament, even the Lord Jesus Christ? For what did that angel say to Joseph when he told her of the one to be born to Mary, his virgin wife to be? What did he say? He said, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That was his name. And we know what that means. We see it illustrated. We see it gloriously described for us in this text in the second chapter of Joshua. Jesus is the judge. He will bring a holy war of Yahweh against a wicked world and those who have never made peace with God. Those who suppose their own good record will be sufficient defense to them on that great and final day. How indeed shall we ever escape if we neglect so great a salvation, if we neglect so merciful a savior. For this much is sure, and hear this, that if you will not take Jesus as your savior, then you will have him as your judge. Jesus is the Father's agent of grace to all who will deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him, all who will confess him as their only Savior and Lord, the conquering commander who is capturing the hearts of men and women and boys and girls around the world. And so this Advent, what shall we name him? What shall be his name? Well, that's easy, isn't it? We'll call him Jeshua. We'll call him Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you in prayer, worshiping you and blessing your name. And, and, and especially, Lord, now as we open your holy word and, and we see the truth of the words of your servant, um, of, of Luther, who said the Bible is the royal chariot in which Jesus always rides. Here we see, Lord, this beautiful picture of, of you, Lord, as a holy judge and you as a glorious and merciful Savior. Father, we thank you for your saving grace. We thank you uh, for your shed blood and for your love for your people. We pray that you would call each one to yourself. And Lord, should there be any who have not trusted in you, that they would cast themselves upon you and you would have mercy upon them. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the birth of your Son, our Savior, that we begin to celebrate in this season. We pray it in his name, amen. Let's sing our final hymn. Um, maybe this is the first uh, Christmas hymn you've sung yet, maybe not. It's, a, it's actually an Advent hymn. You'll find it in the words of the bulletin or if you're using home and you're using a, a Trinity hymnal, red Trinity hymnal, You'll find that on page 194, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. 194, words inside, let's stand to sing. Bye. 
now upon your heads um, God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.